We've seen in the last section that adding the necessary conditions of atoms to the sufficient conditions given by the program almost reduces the models of the obtained completion formulas to the stable models. But well, we obtained the so-called supporter models and they are almost the stable models, but yet we have seen actually that there are some spurious models and these are the guys we somehow have to eliminate. So first of all, let's actually look at a property, namely tightness, which guarantees that supportive models are the same as stable models. Okay, question that we need to ask, what causes the mismatch between supported and stable models? And more or less we've seen this on this uh, unstable yet supported model in the last section, that it's about this somehow cyclic rule that allows us to to derive E despite the completion, right? So, and some of the, the, the cause of this, the answer to this question is that the mismatch between supported and stable models is caused by cyclic derivations. Because keep in mind, atoms in a stable model are all derived from a program in a, in a finite number of steps. Well, again, taking away the negative body literals, but every atom that is in a stable model has a derivation from the facts. And exactly the E here was derived from a self-referential rule which could not provide us with a derivation, that tra a finite derivation that traces back to the facts. Hence, the atoms in such a cycle cannot be derived in a finite number of steps and these are the guys that we have to eliminate. Well, to be honest, there are bad and good cycles, but let's not discuss about this right now. So more or less, whenever we have a cycle and this cycle is supported from from the outside, then actually this outside support can just make you derive the atoms on the cycle. But this is not what we want to look at now. So let's not forget about it, but not consider this now. Okay, so again, the, the atoms true in a stable model have a finite derivation. The atoms that, are spur that have spurious derivations are all derived in, from infinite uh, derivations via cycles. And these atoms actually are the problem and the, the completion formula is in particular the adding of the, of the necessary conditions uh, cannot eliminate this. So we can actually add E to the completion formula of a, of a program and this does not produce a contradiction, hence the model remains, it's not eliminated. And we will actually see later on, in not in this section but the next one, that we can actually add formulas at once such a cyclic um, such a cyclic rule applies or a cyclic derivation is happening, the, the, uh, the current interpretation is, um, is um, eliminated and will not, uh, will not result in a model. Okay, but first of all, you see that I here put already derived a couple of times in quotes. Let's make clear what I mean with a, with a non-cyclic derivation. So here's the definition of a non-cyclic derivation already wrapped in a property uh, of the atoms belonging to a stable model. So, in fact, for every atom that belongs to a stable model, there is a finite sequence of positive rules where each positive rule belongs to the reduct of the program with a stable model. And then when going through the, through the sequence, the positive body literals of each rule belong to the head atoms and thus have been derived previously in the rule. And accordingly, the very first rule must be a fact to satisfy this property. And the very last rule then gives us the atom that we want. It, it, it is the head of the, of the rule, of the last rule in the sequence. So what this gives us more or less is that each atom in the stable model has a non-cyclic derivation and a finite derivation from the reduct with a stable model. And somehow, one way to look at this actually is that, keep in mind, for X to be a stable model, it must equal the consequences uh, of, the, of the, uh, the reduct of the program with X. And the consequences are computed with a TP operator. And the TP operator more or less processes things in bulk, right? It adds all the facts. Then all the heads of the rules whose positive um, body, body literals are derivable from the facts and so on and so forth. And then until it reaches a fixed point and these are then the consequences. Here what we look at more or less is just the sequence of rules that starting from the fact that it needs allows us to derive the atom in question, right? 
So more or less, this is just a refinement, but at least it makes precise what I mean when I talk about a non-cyclic derivation. Good. And keep in mind that on our example, our running example, where we get this spurious uh, supported model, there is no such finite derivation that allows us to derive E by starting from the facts. Okay. So in a way, this could also be one way to, 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 uh, to, well, to eliminate supported models. Just look at all the atoms and check whether they have a finite derivation. But well, there are better ways to do that. Anyway, now that we have talked about non-cyclic derivation, let's get back to cycles and actually try to characterize them. And again, we actually use a concept that is very close to, that we, to, to one that we already use in the grounding section. We've already come across dependency graphs back in the grounding section, but there our life was more complicated, right? So we, we dealt with non-ground logic programs and we looked actually at dependencies among rules. Here we actually assume that grounding is done, we have a propositional logic program only consisting of atoms, and now we are interested in dependencies among the atoms, and actually not the negative dependencies because we've just seen that the derivations actually only look at positive uh, logic programs or positive uh, rules and hence we are interested in the positive atom dependency graphs because we actually hope that these guys indicate where the cycles are. So the definition of a positive atom dependency graph is given here. So its nodes consist of all the atoms in the program, not the rules as in the grounding case. And then we have an arc from one atom to another if there is a rule in which the first atom appears in the positive body literals and the second one constitutes the head of the rule. And now if we have this graph actually, we coin this property of tightness and simply say a program is tight if its positive atom dependency graph is acyclic. Okay, that was quite technical perhaps. Let's look at our example. Here is again our running example along with its positive atom dependency graph. As defined, right, the nodes of the atom dependency graph are made up of all the atoms occurring in the program. And then we have here have three arcs, and actually they stand for necessity to prove something, right? So A is necessary to prove C here. A is the single positive body literal, and it's needed to prove C. Accordingly, B is needed to prove E here. And here E is needed to prove E and this gives us this tiny cycle but well this means that our atom positive atom dependency graph is cyclic and the program is non-tight. And again looking at this uh, graphically just underlines right that the normal dependency structures are all uh, non-cyclic right but here there is this little loop and this actually creates this spurious unsupported unstable supported model, which is this guy, right? So more or less we have one model, one model where E is false, it is this guy, and one model where E is true, and that's actually the unstable supported model. Good. So this is actually, actually how we, just as an example for our positive atom dependency graph, let's actually see what happens to programs that are tight, that do not contain such or other cycles. In fact, whenever the positive atom dependency graph of a logic program has no cycles, then the stable and supported models coincide. And this was actually in the times a pretty famous theorem by François Fage, who showed actually that for tight programs, completion is sufficient and necessary to capture a stable model uh, semantics, right? So when given a, a tight normal logic program, each model of the completion of the program is a stable model of the program and vice versa. So this actually shows that whenever we have no cycles in the, in the dependency graph, then actually completion is enough to give us the stable models. Last but not least, let us look at another example. And this example is meant to show that you cannot simply cut off the rules that induce a cycle because in certain contexts, in certain stable models, they may actually produce legitimate conclusions. 
Okay, let's look at this example. Uh, again, it bears some redundancy, but that's also a bit the, the goal, right? That you develop an eye for what is actually happening in the program, what is relevant and what is irrelevant. I zip it. Good. Anyway, the first two rules here constitute an even loop. So more or less, we either have A or we have B. Good. Now, knowing this, actually, we already know that this rule here will never apply because it needs A and B. And also this rule here will never apply because it more or less needs both of them to be knocked out. Okay. What then remains are, except for this, for the choice between A and B, are these three rules. And looking at that, we see that C depends on D and D depends on C. And that this rule is only active when we have B. And then there's also a rule that gives us D and this rule is only active when we have A. Okay, now this is our program and this smells a little bit like two stable models, right? One with A and one with B. And now the question is what happens with C and D? Okay, here's the uh, positive atom dependency graph along with a lot of dependencies and five atoms in it. But let's look at, let's look at, at this visually because then we can more or less capture what's going on. So we see there are actually quite some dependencies, right? A is needed to derive D and C and B is needed to derive uh, D and uh, C. And then here is, actually the, here is actually the only loop or the only cycle, right? So you can go from C to D and back. This is the cycle. And then there is E all by himself, or by, all by itself this time, because no, there, it, it, it does not allow us to derive anything, right? Good. And what we get here are actually two stable models, one with A, C, and D, and another only with B. Now what is interesting here is because we have this cycle between C and D, and actually once we have A, we get D, and once we have D, why not derive C? So more or less, in, in this case here, in the context where A is true, it makes sense to derive D, and it also makes sense to derive C. So here, the, deriving all the atoms on this cycle is completely legitimate, and, and we want this, okay? This is, the, this is the stable model that we have. On the other hand, the, the stable model that has only B this is a valid stable model, but here again we come in this situation that once we derive B, we have this loop, C if D and D if C, positive loop, right? And here, well, again, once we have derived D, we can either make C and D true or both C and D false, because completion cannot distinguish the two cases, right? And as a consequence, this is here the spurious model that we get the unstable supported model of the program. And here actually the application of the, app of the rules that constitute the cycle is harmful, right? It's unintended because it's a vicious cycle in the sense that it, 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 the atoms be, uh, refer to themselves. There is no finite derivation, no non-cyclic derivation to, to, to throw all the buzzwords at you, right? Uh, while here in the first case it's completely okay because the the cycle between C and D has an external support because we can derive one atom on the cycle without referring to the cycle externally. And this is more or less a key notion that we will experience also in the next session because cycles as such may be harmful or harmless. It all depends whether they have an external support and if there is such an external support then also conclusions along the cycle may happen then they are harmless. It's only more or less when they are up in the air that, that they are vicious and then they are harmful and produce conclusions that we do not want. Okay, all this will be made precise in the next uh, section and we'll also be reconsidering this example there. Okay, so stay tuned.